Yes, hello everyone and uh, welcome to Phylum Nidaria. In the previous lesson, we looked at uh, Phylum uh, Polyphera, where we looked at the organisms called the sponges, the filter feeders, and we saw their characteristics and also their structure. And we realized that they were the most uh, lowest, the most primitive of the animal kingdom. So second to them is another phylum called Nidaria. Phylum Nidaria. In some books they call it phylum Coelenterata. Phylum Coelenterata. Yeah, the phylum Nidaria uh, evolved from the nidocytes, the stinging cells that they have called nidocytes. So that's where the name Nidaria comes from, because they possess uh, the nidocytes. Well, you must have heard about the Hydra. Mm -hmm. How about the Obelia? Well, maybe the sea anemone. How about the Portuguese man of war? Mm, but most probably, you must have heard about the jellyfish. So all those ones are members of phylum Nidaria. So the hydra usually free living in fresh water. Then we have the obelia there. We have the sea anemone, that beautiful member, the sea anemone, and then that guy the Portuguese man of war. Those are members of Phylum Nidaria and then this beautiful one, the jellyfish. Probably you must have seen some of these members in documentaries, on TV. And by the way, please watch those TV documentaries that show animals and nature. You will learn a lot about these organisms. Well, having seen the members of this phylum, let's look at their characteristics. What makes them belong to this phylum? One, they are diploblastic animals, meaning they have two germ layers. Uh, we have the and the endoderm. But in between the two, there is another layer called the mesoglia. And this layer is uh, not having any cells, but has a jelly-like structure. So they are, we know that they are diploblastic. They have two germ layers. Uh, the mesoglia may contain cells that have migrated from other layers, but they, are, they don't have their distinct cells that form that layer called the mesoglia. So their body tissue looks like that. They have the outer cell, uh, outer germ layer called the ectoderm. Then they have the inner germ layer called the endoderm and then in between the two we have they have the mesoglia which is a, largely a cellular they don't have cells but it may be in, in case the cells are there it could be cells that migrate from any of the other two germ layers so that is their body plan they have the stinging cells called nematoblasts yeah, those are cells or nidocytes. Those are cells that can sting. They are capable of stinging to release some irritating chemicals. Some are poisonous. So they have those sting cells and that makes them belong to this phylum. This is a phylum of stingers. Members that can sting. Yeah, so they can sting the prey the food they want to eat, they can also sting the predators to scare them away. So these nidocytes or nematoblasts uh, occur in the ectoderm, in the outermost layer. And when you touch this organism, it can inject you with the toxins. It can also inject these toxins into the prey, the, the food that wants to eat, to paralyze it. Yeah, 
so that is what it uses this nematoblast for so if you want if you were if you go and swim in the in the ocean where the anidarians are especially the sea anemone and the, and the jellyfish then you should be very careful because if you met with the jellyfish the chances of being stung are very high they are radially symmetrical remember we looked at symmetry in the previous lesson and we said radio symmetry means the body can be divided along many planes to produce in a number of equal parts so these members can be divided uh, into more than two parts which are equal and then uh, they exhibit polymorphism polymorphism is the existence of more than two forms of the same organism so these members have two forms they have the more the motile form the mobile form called the medusa and then they have the static form the part the form that doesn't move called the polyp so they exhibit polymorphism in the life cycle of the same organism they also have tentacles which bear stinging cells called nematoblasts those long thread like structures you see there in this jellyfish are called tentacles those long ones and each one of them is well equipped with cells that can sting the nematoblasts or the needocytes and they can sting to paralyze so when you look at the body wall of the structure for example for the hydra that is how it looks like already we have seen the body structure so the hydra belongs to the tissue level of organization which enables cells to act together in a relatively coordinated manner so as to carry out various functions so for them they, they are cells form tissues that can make that can uh, perform different functions so you can see there uh, the ect ectoderm which is well equipped with the needocytes as you can see the mesoglia which is largely a cellular and then the endoderm there and they have different types of cells which are suited or uh, equipped to perform different functions for example you have the nutritive muscular cells uh, you have epithelial muscular cell for protection you have the needocytes for defense and so on well those are the members of phylum nidaria i hope you know now the members of that phylum and you can appreciate that they are also animals we have another phylum here phylum platyhelminthes let's pronounce together phylum platyhelminthes these are generally flat worms who are in this phylum those members who have, who have flat bodies and they include the tapeworm the tinea solium the pork tapeworm and tinea sagnata the beef tapeworm then we have the flukes the liver flukes the hepat the, the fasciola hepatica then we have the blood flukes as well the cystosomas the cystosomes we have the planaria those are that are free living so those are members but uh, what is common with all of them is that they have flat bodies they belong to phylum platyhelminthes so let's see their characteristics uh, one all of them are tripoblastic three tri means three if you say tripoblastic it means they have three germ layers they have the outermost layer called the ectoderm they have the middle layer called the mesoderm and they have the inner layer inner body layer called the endoderm remember the previous two phyla have only they don't have all the three layers they have two the ectoderm and the endoderm this one has a three it is tripoblastic meaning it is much more advanced much more developed than the polyferans and the nidarians that's great and therefore uh, well let's move on 
they have bilateral symmetry. If you divide them into along one plane, you can get two equal parts. For example, if you cut a tapeworm in the middle, along it is a lateral and along its line, middle line, you divide it into two equal parts. So they have bilateral symmetry. They have unsegmented bodies. Their bodies are not segmented. However, if you look at a tapeworm, you may think it has segments, but those are, they don't qualify to be segments. They are called proglottids. We shall look at them shortly. They are not segments. So therefore, the members of this phylum are unsegmented. But what is very important is that, and what is distinguishing them from others is that they are dosoventrally flattened. They have flat bodies. They have flat bodies. Their bodies are very flat. The upper and the lower parts are squeezed to form a flat surface. And then they are hermaphrodite, often with elaborate precautions to minimize cell fertilization. Hermaphrodite means they have both sexual organs, male and female sexual organs, and they have a capacity of self replication, self fertilization. But uh, even with that, they are capable of still of evading self fertilization and they can go for cross fertilization to minimize any breeding. They have mechanisms that we shall see how they conduct that. But they are equipped, each proglotid is equipped with all uh, sexual organs and they can easily. Uh, if it detaches, it can grow into another tapeworm. They have, for their excretion, they have cells that are called flame cells. And those flame cells are responsible for removal of wastes from the body of the flatworm. So in ex excretion, they use flame, flame cells. Right. So you realize that these members of uh, phylum plate helminthes have another layer called the mesoderm. And the possession of the mesoderm has advantages compared to those that don't have it. So let's see the advantages of, of possessing the mesoderm, the middle layer. It allows a triploblastic organisms to increase in size and thus results in two considerable separation of alimentary canal from the body wall. So possession of the mesoderm and it enables increase in size, that middle layer there, enables and separates different body systems. It's used in forming a variety of organs which may combine together and contribute towards an organ system organization. So you see that the body has very many organs inside it. Most of them are developed within the mesoderm. So the presence of the mesoderm allows uh, development of what? Different organs in the body. And then it also enables improvement in the muscular activity by triploblastic animals or organisms. It's necessary because of their increased size, which renders use of flagella and cilia inappropriate. So these larger organisms cannot use cilia and flagella for locomotion. Therefore, they should develop a skeletal system and skeletal muscles to enable them move or locomote from one place to the other. This is only possible with the availability of the mesoderm that provides for that. So the mesoderm is highly advantageous for higher organisms. Great. So when you look at uh, this phylum platyhelminthes, it contains three classes. Remember the kingdom is Animalia, phylum platyhelminthes, and now one is and this phylum. The first class is Tubalaria, the other class is Trematoda, another class is Cestoda. So let's start with the class Tabalaria. So this Tabalaria, these organisms are free living. They live in fresh water under the stones of fresh water, and they are called the planarians. They are free living. They are, most of them are not parasites. And their characteristics include the following. They don't have a cuticle on their body surface. And then the enteron is present. They have the enteron. They have delicate soft bodies. 
their bodies are very soft and delicate. And then they have sense organs, especially in the adult stages. And then they have development of the nervous system, what we call cephalization, development of the nervous system, the brain and the nervous system. So that's why you can see from this drawing, from these uh, uh, pictures, you can see that the eye spots, the, the sense organs are well developed, the ganglia, which are uh, nerves that perform the role of the brain, and then are well developed, as you can see. Then also the ventral nerve cords are well developed. That's what we call cephalization, development of sense organs and the nervous system. So they are highly cephalized. But you can see that their bodies are flat. Yes, and the typical of uh, a platelminths, members of platelminths. So they have uh, flat bodies. So let's look at another phylum, another class. Class Trematoda, the flux. Members include the liver flux. For example, the hepatica, the fasciola hepatica, the liver flux. And then the cystosoma, the blood flux. You remember cystosoma mansoni? Uh, which causes cystosomiasis. Then we have, uh, uh, of course, cystosomiasis is bilharzia. This disease uh, that causes uh, passing of uh, blood urine as a result of perforation of the bladder by the cystosomes and is spread by the, the snails. The characteristics of trematodes, they have a leaf-like shape. Their body looks like a leaf when you look at it. Then they bear suckers for attachment to the host. These members are parasitic, so they have to attach the host using the suckers. They have a thick outer cuticle, and the significance of that cuticle is to protect it from the defense mechanisms of the host. And then they also have the enteron. They are endoparasites. They live inside the body. And there are some that may be ectoparasites that live outside or on the surface of the body. So their bodies look like that. They are like leaves. Yeah, but they have the mouth parts which are well adapted for attachment to the host. So those are the members of phylum Trematoda, the liver flux. When you look at them, they have a color which resembles their host, the liver. When you look at the liver and the liver flux, they almost look the same. But so you have to be very keen to see them. In most cases, they attack the sheep and the cows. If you are not careful, you might end up cooking that liver with liver flux. So when you buy liver and it's not uniformly, the texture is not uniform, there are some dots around it, you have to be very careful. Otherwise, there might be flux. So that's how they evade the host camouflaging we have another class class cestoda and these ones the major representatives here are the tapeworms they include the pork tapeworm tinea solium and the beef tapeworm tapeworm tinea sagnata so we have tinea solium found in pigs and tinea sagnata found in beef but in all of these two, human human being is the def definitive host. It's where their life cycle is completed from. So if you do not eat, if you do not uh, prepare well your pork or your meat, you might end up contracting these ferals and they can invade your body. Their characteristics include the, the following. They are endoparasites, usually found in the intestines of man or tissues of uh, pigs or cows. They have flattened, elongated bodies with a distinct head called the scolex, which bears hooks and suckers for attachment to the host. So we shall see it is a structure. You realize the body has, the mouth parts have, there are some hooks that it uses for attachment to the host. The body is divided into proglottids, which are able to break off. Those proglottids are like segments, and they can break off and grow into another tapeworm. They have no mouth or gut or the enteron. They don't have the gut or the enteron simply because they do not need to digest 
any any food they just suck nutrients from the host they use uh, of course they now have that modif modified part called the scolex which serves the purpose of the mouth otherwise they don't have a proper mouth and the, the gut they use the uh, the host digested food by absorbing it directly through the integuments so they absorb uh, the digested food through the suckers or through the surface of the body there is a thick cuticle for protection against the host's enzyme digestion ideally these organisms may would easily be digested by by the host's enzymes because they live inside the gut of the host the intestines they have a, a, a cuticle that covers their body which prevents uh, them from being digested by the enzymes they don't have the cilia. Well, they don't even need it. Since their transmission from one host to the other does not require locomotor, locomotor structures. So you, when you look at them, they, that's how it looks like. You will see that uh, the body has proglottids, those segment-like structures. And then it has the scolex, that uh, anterior part of it, which, which has hooks and suckers. And if it invades you, it may be very uncomfortable. They can even cause anemia or ulcers. So you have to treat. It can even cause death. Remember to deworm every three months so as to avoid such members from invading your digestive system. So let's look at the adaptations of these members to their parasitic mode of life. How do they manage to be parasites? What enables them to live inside the host without being affected much? One, they have a special way of gaining entry into the host. They have locator structure, so they have a, a special way through which they can be passed from one host to the other. Because one of the hosts eats another host and gets them from there. And as we shall see from the life cycle, it is the host that usually picks them. Uh, they have structures which anchor them into their hosts. For example, the liver flukes have uh, suckers. The, the tapeworms also have hooks and suckers that anchor them into their hosts, that keep them stuck there without being eliminated. Imagine you, our digestive systems have strong peristatic movements that would easily wipe them away but they withstand that pressure from the intestines because of its strong attachment structures and the scolex and the hooks uh, they protect themselves against the internal environment by having the the integuments that protect them from what from being digested and then uh, they also have inhibitory substances that prevent digestive enzymes from digesting them uh, they have a comp complete life cycles. For example, the fasciola and tinea have a secondary host which transfers one parasite from the primary host to another. So they have, a num they have two hosts. There is a primary host and a secondary host. So they, they have mechanisms of transferring themselves. And you realize that part of the life cycle happens in a primary host and part of the life cycle takes place in the secondary host. So they have that mechanism of a split life cycle between the hosts. They have a very high reproductive output. So they can reproduce, they can produce very many offspring that ensure their perpetration. So look at that. Uh, look at the structure there. They have the hooks, they have the scolex, and they have the suckers. That is the anterior part of it. And then they have the proglottids. And those proglottids keep on growing posteriorly. The most mature proglottid is the, the last one posteriorly. Then those near the neck are the new proglottids that have been developed. So that's how it grows. And the last proglottids keep on breaking off, breaking off, breaking off. Yes. And as, as they break off, they, are, they, they, they can be picked by the host 
and that's how they are spread from one host to another. You can also look at the life cycle of the tapeworm. Uh, you can go through it and appreciate how these organisms pass from... Uh, but what is clear is that uh, from the human being, as uh, humans go to defecate, the chances are very high, if you have tapeworms, the chances are very high that you can uh, defecate the eggs of the tapeworm or part of the proglottids or some proglottids can break off and pass away with pass off with the feces and if you defecate in an open area like the bush the pigs can easily pick these feces or eat the leaves around and pick up the eggs of the tapeworm and that's where it enters into the host the pig from there it joins the, the circulatory system and from the digestive system it enters into the blood system from which it will enter into the muscles. So from the muscle is where man again picks it. In case you go and buy pork and the tapeworms have built themselves uh, in the muscles of the pig and you don't cook that pork very well or that meat for that matter, then you can contract them like that. And the life, of, the, the life cycle continues. So you can go and search more about the life cycle and then I appreciate more about it. Well, that was phylum plate helminthes, the flat worms. So this time let's look at another phylum, nematoda. That beautiful picture there shows a nematode there, sometimes called round worms. And the members are those ones. They include the Ascaris lumbricoids which is an intestinal parasite, which is very common in the intestine. Sometimes you young children defecate worms, feces with very many small worms. Those ones are usually the ascaris, the bricoids. But the best way is to always be warm. Every after three months, you can always remove them. Our children are prone to these round worms because they, they pick that all the time. So they, are easily, they can easily contract them. The other one is Wuchereria bancrofti, the one that causes elephantiasis. It affects the lymphatic system and blocks uh, the lymph vessels. So there will be accumulation of wastes there. And uh, you will see the, the, the legs growing bigger and bigger because of accumulation, uh, because of the blockage that is caused by these worms. The Wuchereria bancrofti, it also causes the, the hydrocell. You've heard about people who have hydrocells. However, some of one of these days, the best way is to immunize yourself against elephantiasis or filariasis. Uh, then we have the thread worms. These are also endo endoparasites, especially in the dogs and the cats, but also in the humans, especially children. I told the children are more vulnerable to the round worms because. When they go to play, they pick up that that may contain either eggs or some larval stages of these worms. And some children go and play in water, which is dirty. So that is how they contract them. So they can invade the intestines of children. And they look like threads. That's why they are called thread worms. So let's look at the characteristics of the nematodes. They are also tripoblastic, meaning they have three germ layers. The ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And then they, are, they have bilateral body symmetry. What does that mean? They have, you can divide them into two equal parts. And then they have unsegmented cylindrical bodies. Their bodies don't have segments. And they are round like cylinders. And then the alimentary canal is straight from the mouth to the anus. So they have a complete alimentary canal from the mouth to the anus their sexes are separate so they have the males and the females they do not have locomotor structures like the cilia and then they have a cuticle around their bodies a protein cuticle usually which protects them from the the host digestive enzymes and so on some of them, however, are free-living. 
Free living means they are not parasites. They are able to live alone. So they are not uh, parasites. Some of them are not parasites. However, others are parasites, like we saw earlier, scaris, lumbricoids, and the Ucheraria bancrofti. They are elongated and round in cross section, and then they have the pointed ends. They are pointed on each end. For example, if you saw these ones, you can see that they are pointed from each side. Sometimes difficult to distinguish between which one is the anterior, which one is the posterior part. So members, thank you very much for being attentive in this lesson. And I pray that you, your assignment now is to look at the life cycles of the tapeworm and the liver flukes, but also most importantly to join the campaign to protect yourself against these step worms and these round worms, especially those that are parasites. The only way you can do that is by deworming. If you have not dewormed, please go and deworm because the warming must be done every three months so that you are safer. Otherwise, you might develop complications in your digestive system that may even impair your growth. Thank you very much. May God bless you.